Welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, the Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Jet Setter Show. This is Jason Hartman, your host, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. I think you'll enjoy the interview we have for you today, and we will be back with that in less than 60 seconds here on the Jet Setter Show. Now you can get Jason's Creating Wealth in Today's Economy home study course. All the knowledge and education revealed in a nine-hour day of the Creating Wealth Boot Camp, created in a home study course for you to dive into at your convenience. For more details, go to jasonhartman.com. My pleasure to welcome Jeff Updike. He is with the Sovereign Society, and I've been anxious to get him on the show for a long time now. He is the investment director and executive editor of the Sovereign Individual, and he talks about emerging markets and global growth strategies. And it's just great to have him here from guest Jeff, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, right? Uh, correct, yeah. Well, welcome. How are you? Uh, doing fine. Thanks for having me. Good, good. So tell us about some of the exciting overseas investment opportunities. And nowadays, Jeff, people want to diversify. They want to look at other markets. We definitely live in such a great globally connected world. But a lot of economies around the world are getting pretty scary. You know, there's a lot of talk about the crash of the dollar. <laughs> the U.S. is obviously quite mismanaged. But oddly enough, so many other countries are as well. So I hope you can enlighten us as to the countries that are the least mismanaged and that provide the greatest opportunities. Uh, tell us more. You know, the, the, company, the countries, I'm sorry, that are, that are least mismanaged tend to be Asia. Um, and it's an odd concept for most of Americans to think about because, you know, when you think of Asia, you're thinking of China for the most part. I'm talking about Asia x Japan, by the way. I um, mean, you're thinking of China, you're thinking of Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, and places like that that are small, com- uh, well, China's not, but most of them are smaller economies, and, you know, they are, it, it, you know, developing nations and whatnot, and people look at that and think of them as sort of risky places, places where you're going to find, you know, the, the kinds of um, um, corporate mismanagement and corporate conniving uh, and government problems that people associate with with developing economies and emerging markets and whatnot. But the reality is is that Asia went through um, a vast and major and debilitating currency crisis in 1997 led by the Thai bot. And Asia spent the last decade or so fixing itself, unlike what America and Europe do. Asia basically took the prescriptions of the IMF and fix their economies. Uh, And today they are very strong, very robust economies. And it points to an underlying trend that is what I perceive to be the greatest investment opportunity probably over the next two to three decades. Uh, And that is the emerging middle class, the emerging local consumers that are popping up all over the Asian markets, even the African markets these days. This is a group of consumers that is not unlike you and me. I mean, they are out there buying the exact same things we want. They're buying gallons of milk for the first time. They're buying better cuts of meat for the first time. You know, they're buying cars and motor scooters for the first time in their first houses. All the things that we want, they're buying. They're just buying in their local economy from their local providers. And that's where the real opportunities are for investors going forward is to own the companies in countries like Indonesia that are providing the services and the products that the middle class wants. And I point to Indonesia specifically because it is the world's fourth largest country and it has a very strong consumer population. Much of much of the Indonesia's growth is not related to exports to China or wherever. It's related to the growth of the local consumer. Yeah, well, you know, Jeff, uh, several interesting comments on what you were just saying. First of all, it's interesting to see how the global demand for protein has increased so much. You mentioned the food aspect, and that's never really been that way before 
throughout human history, so far as I know, basically so so much of the world has survived on a diet of rice for so long. And now you see protein products, just the, the demand is increasing dramatically as prosperity increases around the globe. And, you know, we could certainly argue that it's lessened uh, here at home in the U.S., at least in the middle class. But also the African comment. I read an article, I think it was Wall Street Journal uh, several months ago, and it talked about how Africa is really finally, finally getting its act together in some spots and, and emerging as people there are being lifted out of poverty and starting to consume more and more. Pretty pretty amazing and a nice thing to see, for sure. Right, right. Most, most people don't realize, most Americans don't realize that Africa is a continent of about a billion people right now, and fully a third of that country, or a third of that continent, is middle class now. Now, it's not our version of middle class. It's not somebody who's earning thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a year. Middle class in the developing world means you've gone from one dollar a day to two to ten dollars a day. Because at that level you can begin buying the things that make your life better, including the protein that you're talking about. And we can come back to that because I think there's going to be a protein war in the world. But Africa is actually a fantastic opportunity for people, for investors who have the 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 guts to put their money to work in markets where you know you've typically heard about famine, insurrection, pestilence, war, whatever. Uh, that's really going away. And places that that are scary sounding because you've heard bad stuff on the news are actually some pretty amazing markets. And by that I mean places like Rwanda, um, which had its own genocide. I mean that has been an amazing country. It's in the middle of a turnaround. They they have a bunch of companies that have been going public in East Africa, typically in uh, in Kenya or even on their Rwanda exchange. And those things have been cranking out major, major returns. I mean, you, you know, you're seeing double and tripling in share prices. You know, there's, there's just some amazing opportunities to be a, an investor in Africa. In fact, I have an account in Zambia. I own some stocks there. I have an account in South Africa. I own stocks there. Opening an account in Ghana and Kenya right now. So there are some really amazing opportunities to participate in the growth of the African middle class by owning some of the, these companies. Yeah, you know, that's pretty interesting. Uh, you're, you're reminding me of when I read uh, Jim Rogers' book, Adventure Capitalist. And he also, his first book, I guess, was called Investment Biker. I did not read that one, but I, I had him on one of my shows. And, you know, it was interesting when he profiled all of these different markets around the world. And, uh, you know, he'd talk about going to Rwanda and looking at the way their economy works and their trade and their stock exchanges and so forth. But Jeff, I mean, gosh, that's really, really seemingly exotic. I, I think everybody listening who's paying attention and has any brains at all knows that the U.S. stock market is an abject version of organized crime. I mean, it's the modern version of organized crime. But, it, but you know, our crime is kind of legalized here in the U.S. <laughs> amongst these uh, banksters and Wall Street crooks. In these other markets, I just, I don't know. Wow. What, what is it like? I mean, who, who um, you regulates know, you, you, them? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, what you're saying is a fear I hear every time I mention a place like Zambia or opening an account and say Ghana. Everybody has the exact same reaction. And it tends to be that because they just don't realize. They just don't know what's going on. I mean, I, I've been opening accounts overseas since 1995. In fact, I started doing this because of Jim Rogers and his investment biker. And I've talked to Rogers many times. He knows, he knows he's the reason I'm a, a global investor. Um, but I have accounts from New Zealand all the way through Gibraltar. I mean, you know, I have accounts in the United Arab Emirates. I have accounts in Egypt, in Romania, wow. um, South Africa, and places like that. So how, I, how, I know how do you, firsthand. Yeah, how, how do you open them? I mean, what do you do to open an account? You certainly I, don't call I con- Charles Schwab, I, right? I, you know, <laughs> I, I, contact a, I contact a local broker in some particular market. I mean, you can't go through Morgan Stanley or Goldman or whoever like that. It, they're just not going to deal with you. J.P. Morgan, those guys, they will not deal with an American and client in the overseas market, period, end of discussion. Unless you're a multimillionaire and you have some gigantic account and all this kind of stuff and you're willing to trade gazillions of dollars. So you have to go through local brokerage firms. And I contact them and say, hey, I'm American. I want to open a brokerage account. I want to trade local stocks, blah, 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 what I need to do. And they give me the documents. You know, you've got to fill this out. You've got to copy your passport, et cetera, et cetera, and you're good to go. And that's, that's as simple as it is. India just recently, you know, this month actually, the Ministry of Finance 
announced that it's going to begin opening its markets to foreign investors. And so far, you've never uh, an individual investor has never been able to invest in India outside of a mutual fund. And I'm just not the world's biggest fan of mutual funds. Mutual funds are and, a ripoff. You know, yeah, I, well, that and they just you just don't get the exposure to the real companies that you want to own access to. And we can get into that if you want to. But you know, so India is now open, and I've I've been in contact with brokers there for years, and I know exactly what it takes to open an account there. And, and I'll be opening one as soon as I as soon as all the details are set by the Ministry of Finance. So it's very easy to open brokerage accounts overseas. It's not nearly the challenge people think it is, and it's very safe. I mean, I have yet to have any kind of problems. The only problem I have ever had actually happened in a big Western country, which was New Zealand. Uh, and it was simply that a brokerage firm went out of business, and uh, you know the regulator stepped in to control the assets. You know, segregated and whatnot. Sent me a letter, said, "Hey, you know, you've got to do something with your money now." I found another brokerage firm, and everything moved over, and I was good to go. I, I got a I got a phone call. Or I'm sorry, not a phone call. I got an email from a brokerage firm in Zambia that I deal with and I was trying to place a trade for a particular company. The guy emailed me and said, hey, you know, the price you want to buy it at, you're just not going to get it at because there's just too much demand for this stock. But if you give me permission, I'll work your order for you and I'll get you the best possible price. And he did. And he got me a price that was probably three or four percent below the the average price for the shares that week. Um, so they they're not there to rip you off. I mean, they really these these brokerage firms in these countries really want to prove to Western investors that they are legitimate brokerage firms. They want to try and impress you to the degree that they can. It's clearly not the same thing as going online and trading at Fidelity or Schwab. I mean, in many cases, I'm having to trade in a place like Zambia via emails. But I'm not a trader. I I buy stocks for the long haul, and I want to own particular companies. And you know, they make it very easy to do that. In many parts of the world, however, I, I do trade online. I have an account in Hong Kong, and I can trade from Tokyo to Sydney online any time of day. You know, same in Singapore, same in South Africa, same even in uh, Romania. I mean, I can just trade online really easily. Yeah, uh, very interesting. Well, so many of our listeners love real estate. They love income property because it's such a proven asset class. It's so simple and so conservative. However, when you do it internationally, there are some new things you need to know and, and so forth. And, and just so you know, I'm a big traveler myself. I've been to 64 countries, some I've been to many times, and I have looked at a lot of real estate in South America, Europe, Eastern Europe, and Central America. And I just don't find it to be as attractive as American real estate, at least on the at the times I looked at it. And one of the reasons is that it's the financing. And, and in America, real estate in terms of finance, uh, for better or worse, probably for worse, has been really subsidized by the government since the Great Depression through Fannie Mae and then Freddie Mac. And in, in these other countries, you just don't have that financing infrastructure. And, and that's one of the things that I always found to be you know, make it a little less desirable. But there's so much to know, and I am just talking about a very cursory look. Tell me what you found. I I was surprised before we started recording that you mentioned Switzerland. That was really quite intriguing. Uh, Yeah, you know, you're right. I mean, real estate overseas can be a very sticky wicket because there are different laws that apply in all these different countries, and you really have to have a local help you navigate what can be a morass um, in in some of these markets. And, And you're right. I mean, you can't find the kinds of financing you typically typically find in the US. You're not going to you're not going to go to most places and find a 30-year mortgage. It's just not going to happen. Most of them are going to be, you know, 5 years, maybe a 10-year mortgage that you're going to have to reset uh, because they don't want to lock in a 4% interest rate for 30 years because they're not that stupid. They know that interest over time is or inflation over time is going to destroy that 4%. Um, so they're going to make you refi after, you know, 5-10 years. Um, so that that can be a bit of a challenge. So again, you really need a, a professional to help you. As for Switzerland, you know the, the unique thing about Switzerland is that his it it has been off limits to foreign investors for a long time. There's a Swiss law, and I'm completely blanking on the name right now, uh, but there is a Swiss law that basically prevents foreigners from owning land in Switzerland. However, there's a pocket where you can do it, where the law does not exist for a variety of reasons. One of those happens to be down in Andermatt, Switzerland, which I was uh, I was visiting back in December. It's in the heart of mountain country in the Alps. Uh, you know, it's snow country there, or um, a ski country there. It's right, you know, on the on the the uh, train line effectively between St. Moritz and Gosh, I forgot what the other one is now. Anyway, it's a very popular destination, and there is a an Egyptian company of all things called uh, Orascom Development, uh, and they are famous for building really high end resort slash hotel slash 
you know, investment apartment kind of properties, and they're building one in Andermont, and it is going to be a, a stunningly beautiful place and, and just fantastic property. These guys have a long history of doing this. They do it right. They do it well, but it's expensive. I mean, we're talking to get into these things, you know, you're probably talking 300 up, um, and for really nice ones, you're talking probably a million. So three. Uh, so, you're, so, now, so just, just to clarify, Jeff. So three hundred thousand to a million U.S. Correct. Yeah, three hundred thousand to a million U.S. And and it probably goes from there. I think there's a penthouse that's substantially more. But it, you know, it, it is the opportunity to get into Switzerland for people who have the money and who want their assets offshore and who particularly want to be in a place like Switzerland, which is just a fantastic country. This is the way to do it because you can find, you can get into this particular property as a foreign investor, you can own the property unlike other places in Switzerland, and they have a an investment pool there. So, you know, if you if you literally want to live here, hey, great, that's fine. Move to Andermatt, which is a beautiful place. Uh, if you don't, if you just want a place to call home when you're in Europe or when you're in Switzerland, just in the in the rest of the time you want to rent this thing out, well, you can, and and they'll guarantee some sort of you know level of of income from that. I think it's three or four percent a year. I can't remember now. But you know that that is one way of looking at at properties in foreign markets that you can stick into an investment pool somehow that's run by the developer. Uh, you know you got to check these things out. Not all of them are up to snuff. This is one of them that seems to be up to snuff. Um, but that is you know one way to approach real estate overseas. And what are the rent to value ratios there? For example, if you if you buy a now these are condos. I assume you're talking about in Switzerland, right? Yeah, condos, apartments. Uh, you know. Yeah. Same idea, but but common type community type housing versus single family right, homes, right. which is more common in Europe. So a three hundred thousand dollar condo, what will that rent for on a monthly basis? You know, I don't have any of the numbers yet because they are still in the process of of building this thing. It's not it's not going to be completed until I think next summer or maybe next next fall ski season twenty. 13, 2014, something like that. But I, we're working on a, on a piece on this now, actually, for the Sovereign Individual Newsletter. It's for our um, our February piece. And I'm still actually waiting for a bunch of the data to come in. So I don't have the information with me now, but it will be in our in our upcoming newsletter. I remember when I was looking at properties, I looked at properties on one tour on in five Eastern European countries. I looked at uh, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Romania, Bulgaria, and uh, I can't remember the other one at the moment. And I was looking there, and they have, in other countries, there's no such thing as an MLS or a multiple listing service, at least not that I've noticed. And then they have these condo projects, and they're called off-plan projects. There's some different terminology and some different things you need to know. Uh, but but one of the things that I, I wasn't very fond of is the lack of a multiple listing service where you couldn't really check comparable sales and the data just wasn't as streamlined as it was in the U.S., which oddly, you know, in imperfections in markets like that, that's one of the reasons I don't like stocks is they're too perfected in terms of a, a market. Imperfections do lead to opportunity. If you really, really have deep knowledge of a market, you can get opportunities. But what are your thoughts about that? I know it's a bit of a compound question. No, no you're, you're, you're correct. I mean, that's, that is a big challenge when it comes to real estate overseas. I mean, there's just not the same level of, of service that exists in, in the U.S. markets. Um, so you, again, it, it goes back to you really need to be hooked up with a local who understands this market. And I wouldn't just choose one. I mean, I would choose two or three and interview them and play them off of one another. And don't, you know, don't make it obvious you're playing it off. I mean, don't say, well, so-and-so told me this. I mean, you know, when you're talking shop to one around. and sure. Yeah, I, exactly. Shop around and, and use the knowledge you get from one to test the other uh, and see what kind of, you know, what kind of responses you get. So you can build a level of comfort with the person you ultimately, you know, hire to to be your your sort of real estate guide to these particular markets. Uh, but you're right about the the inefficiencies as well because the, that happens in markets overseas, which is why I like foreign stocks over the U.S. stock market because you just don't find the same level of analyst coverage, institutional coverage when you're playing around in a place like the Philippines or Zambia or wherever, there's going to be big brokerage firms from Hong Kong or Singapore or wherever that might be covering the largest stocks in a particular market because that's where the big Western institutional guys want to go because of liquidity. They want to own the big brand names that they can get into and out of very quickly. I play around in the small and mid caps because that's where the real growth opportunities are. That's where the real companies are that are serving the, the local consumers and not some big multinational sell 
selling all their products into Western Europe and, and the U.S. And there's an inefficiency that exists because you don't have a lot of institutional guys covering these small growth companies in you know the Philippines or Malaysia, Indonesia, et cetera. And there's some great, great opportunities to own the kinds of consumer companies I want to own at really great prices and, and even great dividends, you know, 5, 6, 10, 12%, whatever, and, and, and hold them for a while and watch them grow. When, when you're talking about the offshore investing in terms of stocks and, and the traded assets like that, the non-direct investments, what are your concerns? I'm sure you've had them. <laughs> That's why I'm assuming you have them. Maybe you don't. About the ever so hungry and voracious U.S. government, especially the Obama administration, who has been just cracking down on overseas accounts and putting so much pressure on other countries. And the IRS is now being accused of a bait and switch on the amnesty program that they had for people who, you know, well, usually very wealthy people who had those accounts with UBS and and that kind of stuff. And, And now they're, I guess, really giving those people a hard time. The ones who came forward and did the right, the quote unquote right thing and acted under the amnesty program and volunteered the information to the IRS and now they're they're really running into some trouble. The U.S. requires you to pay taxes on all worldwide income. But even if you pay the tax, it's like with the IRS, you're guilty until proven innocent. And you, you just, you may have a fight on your hands. You may have a worry on your hands, even if you're doing everything right, just because you have holdings outside of the U.S. Your thoughts? Right. The, the U.S. is a parasite. Um, it's all there is to it. I mean, the U.S. government is a third world bankrupt banana republic of a government <laughs> that pretends to be a a beacon of light and freedom in a dark world and it's well, just it, a bunch it used of to, it used to it used to be a beacon of light and freedom but now it's a joke yeah, yeah it, it used to be now it is now it's becoming i mean i cannot tell you how many conversations i've had i've been in, i was in 20 countries last year um for for you know doing research and reporting and whatnot uh, and i can't tell you how many people in those countries look to the u.s nowadays and they don't see america the great they see america soon to be the socialist nation and they are not very happy with it because this is not what America set itself out to be. So the U.S. government is a parasitic leech that is looking for any way it possibly can to pull money from its citizens. We're the only, one of the only countries in the world that has this goofy policy of taxing worldwide income. If I don't earn my money in America, then America should not tax it as far as I'm concerned. But that's not the laws. Um, and, you know, I, I follow the laws and I report all my accounts overseas and all that kind of stuff. And for the most part, brokerage accounts are not subject to the same kinds of, of diligence that that bank accounts are. Uh, so there's there's this FATCO thing that's out there, the Foreign Asset uh, Tax Compliant Act or something like that. It's, it's got banks around the world just freaked out. It's, it's the reason that Switzerland has become a less interesting place for banking secrecy these days because the Swiss banks are all freaked out by FATCO. But you don't really find many brokerage firms around the world, particularly those in Asia. They're just not really worried too much about FATCO, except maybe the ones in Singapore for whatever reason. They're kind of freaked out over there. You go to Hong Kong, you go to Sydney, you go to you know, Indonesia, Malaysia, and you, you try to open a brokerage account. They're going to welcome you with open arms. You go to Singapore and you're trying to open a bank account, they're going to freak out. And it's simply because banks are where the U.S. is really looking right now. They're not too involved with, um, with the brokerage firms. Hopefully that, that doesn't change. Hopefully they stay away from brokerage firms and, and make my life a little easier. Well, let's go back to real estate for a moment. So we talked about Switzerland, and I asked you that one first because I just found it to be the most amazing that it would be a recommendation because it's so expensive. But what other countries do you like for real estate investments, countries and cities? Actually, one of the, one of the countries I really like, I'm going back down there next month for a conference uh, that we're hosting is in Uruguay. And it's a place most people never think about. It's a tiny little country on the butt end of, of Brazil, jammed like a little arrowhead between Brazil and, and Argentina. Yeah, I've heard uh, a lot about it. Think of, yeah. yeah, people think of Uruguay and Paraguay in the same breath, and they don't know what they are, and they just sound like weird little banana republics, and Paraguay largely is. Uruguay's not. I mean, Uruguay is a very democratic, very middle-class population filled with nothing but Europeans, mainly those from Spain and Italy. 
it's a fantastic place. Mon- uh, Montevideo is a gorgeous, you know, Spanish city. There are parts of Montevideo, particularly Churrasca, uh, Churrasca, which looks just like, you know, maybe San Diego or something. And you go off into Punta del Este and Juan Ignacio, and it looks a lot like La Jolla or something. It- it's where the Brazilian billionaires hang out, French billionaires. It's where all the Brazilian supermodels hang out uh, during during the summer. It's just a beautiful country, and there's great opportunities there. To own real estate, you can own housing uh, in in Montevideo. You can own housing and apartments in uh, in in, uh, in Punta del Este, and, and the housing there looks like something you would find in you know a typical American city. It's neighborhoods, it's traditional kinds of grocery stores that you would see, like a Safeway or or, or something like that. And you can own if you don't want to actually own, say, a, a property to to live in or to rent out, you can own ag land all over Uruguay. I mean, Uruguay is one gigantic farm, um, everything from cattle and soybeans to wheat and whatnot. Uh, and, you know, Archer Daniels Midland has a big terminal down there because of all the, the soy that comes out of there. There's a just a ton of cattle that come out of there. Some of the some of the best beef I've ever had was in Uruguay, actually. And they're, they're qualified to send their beef directly into the EU. And EU has some of the strictest beef import rules in the world. You can take a piece of, of beef from Uruguay and find it in a, a grocery store in Poland, and you can track that piece of beef all the way back to Uruguay, all the way back to the farm, all the way back to the individual cow that it came from. They're one of the only countries in the world that can track every single piece of, of meat that comes out of out of the country. Uh, and there's some great opportunities to own you know, land down there. There's a lot of land managers, a lot of farm managers and put together investment funds. A lot of Europeans and Americans are coming down there, uh, even Asians, and putting their money to work in, in Uruguay agriculture because it's such a great opportunity to earn, you know, depending on how you structure the, your investment, you can earn anywhere from, say, 3 or 4% a year all the way up to you know, 9 to 12% a year on your, on your investments in Uruguay and ag. And what about the real estate, though? Um, real estate, you're going to earn probably in the neighborhood of five to maybe nine or ten percent, depending on what you buy, where you buy, and how good you are at uh, at negotiating uh, the initial cost. In, in Montevideo, in particular, in the heart of Old Town, they are taking buildings that are from the 1800s, early 1900s, um, really old, gorgeous brick buildings, and they are gutting them and turning them into high-end apartments. And, and lofts and condos and whatnot, and they're really beautiful. I mean, they're just really, really beautiful old buildings, and they're doing a fantastic job interior. And and you're you know you can buy these things for somewhere between a hundred to maybe two hundred thousand dollars at the low end, and you can generate really nice returns on that. I mean, there's there's a demand for for rental real estate in Montevideo because it's a you know it's a booming city in in South America. And so, say those returns again. Did you say five percent? Yeah, five to maybe nine or ten percent on. Okay, so uh, I just want to I want to compare that return for a U.S. investor. So when you say that, you mean the rental yield on the property annually, probably right? And maybe we right. could compare that to a cash on cash return. So, for example, if you put one hundred thousand dollars into a property, you're going to get five to ten thousand dollars back annually. Is that? The proper Correct. analysis, yeah. and and does that yeah. include a a vacancy rate, management costs, maintenance maintenance costs, all of those things? You know, I I just don't have all those numbers at my fingertips. I I was down there last February, um, and I just can't remember all the details honestly. Um, I mean, I'll know more when we get back after our expedition um, next month. Uh, but I just I just can't remember what all the numbers were because we were down there studying you know real estate we were down there studying ag land and all that kind of stuff and and there's just I have a, a jumble in my head of numbers and I just can't tell you I can't pull them all out right now. Sure, sure. And you know by the way, just so I know where you're coming from, Jeff, when you talk about these markets around the world, are you pretty much just a stock investor in those markets, or do you own real estate in these countries too? In some of these countries, I, I, I am right now a stock investor uh-huh. only. Okay. Um, however, I am looking to own real estate. Uh, potentially in Uruguay. Okay, good. And in terms of financing, is there any mortgage financing available or is that just, you just pay cash for stuff, right? Yeah, mostly you're going to pay cash for stuff. I mean, there are some there are some places where you're going to find mortgages, and I believe you can in Uruguay. I just can't remember Canada. You can. I mean, I've, I've had conversations with folks in Canada out in Vancouver. Oh, sure. Well, Canada is a you know highly developed country. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Australia, clearly, you can. Although the Aussie market is a little overheated right now, 
you know a lot of the, a lot of the big developed markets you can the the smaller markets where they just don't have uh, a, a mortgage finance structure in place you're probably not but a lot of the, you know there's a lot of developments like the one I was talking about in Switzerland there are a lot of developments around the world, particularly when you go into into Asia, uh, like uh, southern Thailand or along the beaches and into Bali and places like that in Indonesia. You're going to find a lot of developments that are being built specifically for Western investors, ten- tending to be British and, and Australian and New Zealanders um, who want to own investment property in these sort of uh, higher-end tourist markets, uh, and so there's a lot of really nice development, I mean really nice developments. Uh, and, and, those, and in those situations, you may not find a mortgage, but you will find a type of financing that's tied to the developer or some bank the developer is working with in which you're going to put down you know, X percent when you sign the contract, and then you're not going to owe any more money for another year until something, you know, some event happens, and then you're going to owe the final chunk of money you know, two years later. And some of that you can finance to a small degree through the bank. It might be a, a three-year or five-year loan. So there, there's, there are levels of financing available, but it's not going to be the same sort of mortgage structure that you're accustomed to in the U.S. Yeah, the U.S. just has such a highly developed mortgage market. And I say that, you know, for better or worse, <laughs> as I mentioned before. Right, right. Let me take a brief pause. We'll be back in just a minute. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn more about investing in real estate in different markets, there's a show for that. If you want to learn 17 ways rich people think and act differently, there's a show for that. If you want to know how to get paid to borrow, there's a show for that. And if you'd like to know why Amsterdam doesn't take dollars or why pools are for fools, there are even shows for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from jasonhartman.com or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. But in, in some of these other countries, you know, we've all heard the stories about Americans who who lost their land in Mexico and had the government take it away. When you look at places like Dubai, which, you know, obviously had this completely overheated, crazy real estate market that people thought there was no end to it, just like they did here, idiots. But like a, a non, for example, in Dubai, I've heard that non-Muslims don't have rights in their courts. And just always feel like as a foreigner, I mean, you even see this around the U.S. When you litigate things in other parts of the country, you get what they call hometown, where the outsider is always sort of the person who gets the short end of the stick. And certainly a foreigner in another country, the government's going to be maybe a lot less likely to really care if they they need to nationalize something or you know, something like that. No, no, you you're absolutely right. I mean, that that those are the risks you face being a an investor in foreign assets. I mean, I would argue that a similar risk exists in the US. Um, as the Obama administration shows, it's not averse to nationalizing things as it did with banks and as it did with GM. Um, which it should never have done. Um, so, so government, even in the U.S., will nationalize things when it's in its best interest or perceived its best interest, regardless of, you know, who the shareholders are, uh, who the owner is. Yeah, and in GM's so, case, I mean, that was the bondholders that got yeah, nationalized. Yeah, the bondholders got, got yeah, right. yeah, they got they got screwed at the at the at the benefit of the the of unions, the, the uh, UAW unions yeah. that didn't take a single, you know, didn't, didn't get hit at all. It's disgusting. Which is but, but you know, yeah, those exactly. those UAW workers all support the corrupt Obama administration, so that's that's why that's the way it is. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So, but all I'm saying is that in the US at least if you're listening to this and you are a U.S. citizen, we have audience all around the world, you're probably going to have more rights. It's going to be harder for them to do because, you know, just the traditions and the history, when you look at a country like the U.S., which I couldn't agree more is going the wrong direction, but not without a fight. That's all I'm saying. No, you're, you're, you're right. I mean, there's definitely rule of law here that, that has precedent. There's rule of law in, in the U.K. And, and the British colonies and whatnot. And, and that's why I would be 
careful of the kinds of places where I buy real estate. I mean, I would do some real homework on those local markets and make sure that you know you you feel comfortable with what you're getting yourself into legally. I feel fairly comfortable with a place like Uruguay. Um, I feel comfortable with some portions of of Argentina. There's there's a fantastic development in northern Argentina that we can talk about if you want. I, I would feel comfortable there. I'd feel comfortable in Switzerland, uh, despite the cost you're gonna you're gonna pay for. Um, but you know, the, by that said, I mean I'm not gonna rush into a place like say Egypt and 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 plunk down a bunch of money on a property, even though there are some fantastic opportunities there. You know, I would probably feel leery as well about a place like Turkey, where there's some opportunities popping up for um, for real estate developments along the coast. Um, so you just really have to do your homework on the laws. As again, this is where it gets to hiring the locals and and and, and really spending time with the field and understand what is the downside. What what are my rights as a as a landowner in in country X? Sure. Yeah. Very good. Very good points. Well, just in wrapping up, what else would you like people to know? Yeah, well, you mentioned uh, development in northern Argentina. I did look at real estate in Buenos Aires when I was there. And again, just felt very expensive, no mortgage financing, really old properties, maintenance issues. And, you know, I just, I don't know, I just haven't quite been convinced, but I'm I'm certainly open-minded to it because I look at all of these markets around the world with complete fascination. I really do. just haven't quite seen one yet. I'd say the closest I got to being interested internationally is Panama. Out of any international market, that is probably the one that I felt most comfortable with. Yeah, pa- Panama sort of strikes me as a weird place, though. Um, I was in Panama City for a conference last year, and I, I, you know, this is just a personal thing. I mean, this, this gets to a conversation you and I having before the recording started, and that was buying real estate is a highly personal thing. And and, and seeking a second passport or residency somewhere else if you wanted to pursue that, or the best country to live if you wanted to be outside. It's all very, it's all very subjective, to, and it's all very reliant on your personal your personal view of life. Uh, and, and to me, Panama is Panama City in particular is probably one of the ugliest cities I've been to in, in the last five years. Um, yeah, I mean, I wasn't like a, super impressed with it, but you know, I, I talked to Kathleen Petticourt about it and. Before I talked to her, I went down there and looked. And, you know, it's on the U.S. dollar. It's got all that American infrastructure. It's got those 10- and 20-year tax abatements uh, on occasion. One of my clients moved there from from uh, Southern California, and I hear about it from him. So, you know, those were kind of some of my reasons. But, again, I, it's not like I did it. I just I was just commenting that that was the one that made me maybe feel the safest. Yeah, and, and, and if you're doing it just for an investment purpose, it's probably good. If you, I mean, I'm looking at it in terms of where would I want to live, assuming I buy a property and I want to do something with it in the future that's not just investment related. Maybe I want to live there at some point. You know, Panama City is just not a place I ever want to live. I mean, I think it's probably a, the biggest third world um, metropolitan area I've I've been in. It's just it's just not it's just not an attractive place to me. Yeah, you know, so many of them are so third world. Like last year, I went to Belize with one of my investment counselors from my uh, real estate company, and we looked around, and you know, I called the bank down there and thought of opening a bank account. I know there was a, like a thing in the law that was changing, and I thought I better do it before it changes. And I went into the bank and, I don't know, spent about a week there, and I just was not impressed. You know, I look at these other real estate groups that are promoting property in Belize, and I can't eat. I don't get it. I just don't get it. There must be something I'm missing, yeah, or, or they're just a bunch of shysters. Not, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're not the only one who said that about Belize. I mean, I've never been to Belize, but everybody I've talked to... It's um, a, it's a t- talk about a banana thing. republic. There's like no industry there at all, except hardwoods and drug trade. It's, it's a beautiful place if you want to sit on the beach all day, but I, I don't know. That seems kind of boring to me, but... Maybe maybe I'm just well, too that, much of that, a type A. You know, that, that's <laughs> why I like. That's why I'm, I'm such a fan of Uruguay because it is not. It's cosmopolitan. It doesn't look right? anything yeah. at all like what most people would think of a, you know, a Latin American um, city. Uh, it's not Panama. I mean, it really is a beautiful country. The the cities are nice. Um, you know, it's just like something you would see in, in you know an average place in America. So it's a it's a fairly uh, you know, it's it's a very middle class place. It's a very stable place, and it's so it's a nice nice country. Yeah, good stuff. Well, hey, just kind of wrap this up for us. And and what what would you like people to know about any other things we didn't cover? Give out your website, any of the services you provide, etc. Yeah, we have uh, sovereignsociety.com dot com, and you know we are effectively a a, a newsletter that advocates 
getting your assets to work for you offshore, all through legal means, all IRS compliant, et cetera. You know, we're not we're not telling anybody to do anything that's going to cause them uh, any sort of uh, tax problems. It's simply we think people should have money to work overseas, and that means foreign brokerage accounts to a degree, foreign bank accounts, and and to the degree that's, that they can afford it, uh, foreign real estate. It also means we want people to consider second passports and residency in another country in case we get to a situation where the U.S. just becomes an unbearable place to live. And, and I could make an argument, and I won't do it here or now, but I could make a really strong argument that the U.S. is moving in that direction and that we could see you know, uh, states begin to break away from our country um, because we are just moving in the absolute wrong direction. But that's a conversation for another day. You know, what, Jeff, time, it, you know, it's interesting. Interesting that you mentioned that, though, because I've predicted that for many years, and people used to say I was crazy doing it. But I think I could easily see Texas going first. And and you know what my prediction has always been? If that were to happen, Texas would become the Hong Kong of the United States. The productive people would leave the other states, which would be great. It would be a free market of states, and that's why we should have states' rights. And they would leave, and they would go there to a more business-friendly environment. And all of the slackers, you know, they would stay in places like California and let the place go bankrupt. It's it's what I Rand predicted it's atlas shrugged happening right in front of our eyes yeah that's, that's right. amazing yeah, yeah it really is well good stuff jeff updike thank you so much for joining us today really really fascinating i, I love your work i read your newsletters and, and they're just great and keep telling people about this because what it's all about folks is freedom of choice and awareness and looking at yourself as a citizen of the world there are many opportunities out there globally so don't just think locally don't just think nationally think globally and just have this stuff in the back of your mind because Jeff, as you were just saying, th- things are they're moving in the wrong direction. And if they do get to a point where it really makes sense to some people have already made that decision to leave and and do do other things, but some haven't yet. And you just want to be aware of what's out there. So it's a it's a great service you're providing. And give out your website one more time if you would. Uh, it's sovereignsociety.com. Fantastic. Thanks so much for joining us, Jeff. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks a lot. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.